Warning, this episode may contain traces of science. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Bloke on the Range. Today we're looking at replicating, as far as possible, the wax coating that John Peterson applied to the cartridges for his toggle delayed blowback rifle. Both Forgotten Weapons and TFB TV have fired original ammunition through an original rifle, and I'll put in some links to these great videos. Now, why is lubrication sometimes needed on a cartridge? When a cartridge is fired, the pressure inside the case causes it to expand, gripping the walls of the chamber, particularly in the neck and shoulder area. Since the material of the case is elastic, when the pressure drops, a certain amount of this expansion is reversed, and the case shrinks back away from the wall of the chamber. But if an action unlocks under too high a pressure, or isn't locked at all and the bridge block starts to move, if the neck or shoulder is still gripping the walls, then in the case of gas or recoil operation, the extractor can slip over or tear through the rim, or the case head can be just blown off backwards in a blowback gun, causing a case head separation and rendering the rifle useless until it can be extracted with a special tool. This is generally not a problem with pistol caliber firearms, since the pressure is too low to cause a problem in any case. Now Japanese and Italian machine guns in particular suffer from poor action timing, resulting in unlocking at high pressure. This is why they are often uh, provided with cartridge oil as built in. And these case head separations are why delayed blowback firearms in rifle calibers used to incorporate oilers or some other form of lubrication some even involving hand lubing the cartridges as they were loaded into the magazines or other feed device. This lasted until fluted chambers were developed. Now briefly what a fluted chamber does is it directs a certain amount of powder gas around the side of the cartridge towards its base, more or less floating it on a layer of gas. Now the problem with wet lubrication is that oil attracts dust and dirt which we don't want to be introducing into the rifles. And the problem with fluted chambers in the 20s or 30s, which is the period we're really talking about here with the Peterson rifle and the various other uh, blowback developments, is that they hadn't been invented yet. So John Peterson's solution was to develop a hard wax coating that was dry to the touch and hardly noticeable, and wouldn't get sticky and attract crap. And it had the added advantage of reducing the season cracking of the cases in long-term storage. Bonus! Now, what is this mysterious wax? How many parts of Venezuelan beaver cheese are mixed with how many wren's livers? Well, like any good inventor, John Peterson filed a patent on it in 1926, and I've got a copy of it here, which tells all the world what the magic recipe is. Well, it's a dip made of 7% sericin wax in carbon tetrachloride solvent at 50 degrees Celsius. Simples. But what is this sericin of which he speaks? Do we need to scale Himalayan mountains to go and talk to monks who can only communicate in a long dead language and then sing to them the greatest hits of David Hasselhoff in German? <laughs> nah, it's high quality church candle wax, like this one, as featured in many a dirty German film. Ah, come on, don't be coy with me, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. Now, carbon tetrachloride, nasty stuff. Difficult to get hold of, don't really want to touch it or breathe it. However, I did recently discover that I could get dichloromethane, which is much safer and very similar stuff, but with two of the chlorines replaced with two hydrogens. It does, however, have a much lower boiling point, so we'll be doing this at a lower temperature than uh, John Peterson himself. So why are we bothering to do this at all, aside from just from the sheer science geekery of it? Well, it turns out that I've got a bunch of 308 Norinco ammo that just won't run in my M1. And what's more logical than spending $50 and a whole bunch of time on seeing if you can make $40 of ammo run through your gap? And not forgetting our everlasting and priceless contribution to the total sum of human knowledge if it works. So let's get to it. So I made up a 7% solution weight for weight of uh, sericin wax in dichloromethane. Uh, sericin is a bit less dense than carbon tetrachloride, so this will be a slightly thinner solution. However, at room temperature, um, it's just this horrible crystalline mush that's no good to man, fish or fowl. So uh, what I'm going to do is, first of all, run this under the hot tap. 
get it all into solution and uh, then keep it warm on the hot plate. And there we go, all warmed up, goes into a nice solution and uh, I just happened to this, have this gorgeous chintzy 70s plate warmer to keep everything warm. Cool, these gloves make me look like a French mime. Now part of, whee, part of the uh, difficulty here is that we've got a very narrow window to do this in. As you've seen at room temperature, the uh, wax doesn't stay in solution. Uh, the other problem is that it boils at a, that the solvent boils at about 40 degrees. Now carbon tetrachloride boils at about 77 degrees, so I suspect that uh, John Peterson had a rather wider um, temperature range in which to work. Now if we take a cold cartridge and dip it, what happens is that the uh, the solution goes out of solution and uh, just solidifies as the as the mush. In fact, it doesn't really solidify uh, on the cartridge that you saw before. And we'll just set that one aside, and I'll show you how to deal with that in a bit. The other problem is if you take a really nice and warm cartridge. In fact, this one's too warm. Ooh, very much too warm. Do it anyway. It boils the solvent. The problem here is the Goldilocks problem, it's getting it just right. Now let's see if we can demonstrate this a bit, bit better. Now hopefully this one is vastly too hot. Uh, not too bad, but it boils it a little. We've got one that's too cold, it's sitting out on the windowsill. Oh, that one's really gone milky, look at that. Horrible. And we've got one that's been in my pocket that should be just right. We hope. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Now you can see there that the one that's too cold is just gone, it's just absolutely horrible. Now hopefully that we've got the one here that is really very much too hot. Let's see if this really goes to town. Yeah, there you go. That's what happens when it's really too hot. So what I'm probably going to end up doing is uh, putting everything back and forth on and off the heater. Now I've boiled a bit. It'll do though. Good enough for government work. Now Peterson had a second patent which mentioned preheating the cartridges to the same temperature as the solvent. Um, easy if you're doing it in industrial quantities, difficult if you're doing it in your spare room by an open window because you don't want to breathe too much of this stuff. We're just going to try and get as many of these done as we can. Now these are still too hot but it uh, honestly I can't tell any difference. It's just a bit wasteful of solvent. Keep topping it out. Whee. In the second patent John Peterson also mentioned that uh, having preheated cartridges did help with the drying process. He found that when, uh, when blow drying them, he had to apply a lot more energy than uh, having had them preheated, or at least so the patent claims. Now if we look at the one I put in far too cold, you'll see that it's got this incredibly thick uh, layer on it, and uh, that's not just wax, there's a whole bunch of solvent encapsulated in this. However, we have a solution. So we can dry the solvent off with a hairdryer and make it dry. Um, now what's interesting is these that have been sitting here for a few minutes now, the, uh, the coating is still very, very soft. It seems that some of the solvent stays in there for quite a long time. Here's ones I, I made in a first test that I didn't film a few days ago, and uh, to be honest, if you didn't know they were waxed, you wouldn't know they were waxed, just like the originals. Uh, I stuck these in a polystyrene block, and this uh, the solvent tends to eat the polystyrene, but uh, they're very, it's a very, very fine, very, very hard layer. 
this one if you know you're looking for it you can uh, you can see the line where the wax went to but what we'll do now is we'll leave these uh, overnight and we'll take them to the range tomorrow and try them out so we're out here on the range I've got my spaghetti M1 I've got some of that superb MEN military surplus brass case 308 I've got some untreated uh, Norinco and I've got a big bag of what we treated yesterday. Now first of all what we're going to do is uh, throw a clip of MEN through as a control, make sure the barrel is uh, at a constant state. I've just previously degreased it and uh, we'll see what happens. Right, pink ones, Urinco. Let's see how if this goes as badly as I remember that it did last time I tried this stuff. Well, that went all right. Let's try another one. Day. Just what I didn't need. <laughs> well, let's try one more clip and see if it'll actually jam this time. I swear last time I used this stuff it went horribly. Well that wasn't exactly how that was meant to go. The one time I don't want them to run, and they run. Whenever I've tried to use them when I did want them to run, they didn't. Anyway, let's see if we can at least replicate what uh, TFB TV and uh, Forgotten Weapons found when shooting original Peterson cartridges in terms of uh, what the cartridge looked like after firing. So here's eight lubed ones. Well that went in easier. Oh, and then I get a jam. Nice. <laughs> I mean, look at that. That looks exactly like they did on uh, the other videos. Now, if we compare this if we compare this to uh, one of the earlier ones for, well, that were unlubricated, which are just totally bone dry, these have a nice greasy layer on them. Here's some others. They've just got this thin layer of uh, slippery grease on them. So here's another clip of eight. Now just watch how, how easily that goes in by comparison. Yeah, so the wax does exactly what it's supposed to do. It turns into a nice lubricating liquid uh, when it gets warm. Result! It's quite cold here. It's colder than uh, 
wherever it was when uh, when Alex and Ian shot the original Peterson. This wax re-solidifies fairly quickly. Nice. Very, very waxy black crud blowing out through the back of the gas system. Because I hold my hand quite a long way forward, it uh, seems to vent onto my hand quite successfully. But that is very waxy, so clearly the wax that's on the bullets is uh, making it through the gas system. Interesting. Now thinking about it, those stoppages there seem to be uh, cartridges jumping out of the clip early, which might have been caused by the wax, but we didn't have any failures to extract, which I used to have last time I uh, used those uh, particular cartridges. Now what actual practical uses do we have for this? Because clearly this might not really be a solution so that I can shoot Norinco in my particular M1. Now obviously uh, anyone who is lucky enough to own an original Peterson rifle, you know who you are, you lucky person, you. But it might also be useful for shooting nasty, sticky uh, surplus ammunition in Mosin Nagants. Because essentially a lot of the problem with the Mosins is that the, uh, the, the steel cases, whether they're lacquered or copper plated, they seem to stick in the case and uh, give problematic extraction. This might be a solution. We'll have to see if we can get hold of uh, a Mosin later in the year and try it out. So I hope you found the video interesting. Like and subscribe, like our Facebook page and see you again on the range sometime. Bye! Finish this off.